Good evening, everyone. I am Montgomery County Council President Gabe Arbus, and it is a privilege and honor, privilege and honor to be with all of you this evening. Uh, tonight is a public hearing on the fiscal year 2023 proposed operating budgets and FY23 through 28 public services program and fiscal policy for Montgomery County Government, Montgomery College, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, and Montgomery County Public Schools. Committee operating budget work sessions have already begun this week, and we will have full council work sessions to discuss the budget uh, beginning in early May. We thank you all so much for taking the time to testify this evening. We've heard some extraordinarily compelling testimony in previ previous uh, public hearings regarding the budget this year. We appreciate your civic activism and your leadership, and I'm uh, happy to turn it over now to Ms. Jordan Lindsay from our Public Information Office, who will help facilitate tonight's discussion. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Council President, and good evening and welcome to all our speakers this evening. I'm Jordan Lindsay. Now, each of you will have two minutes to provide your testimony, and we ask that you mute yourself when it's not your turn to provide your views. Tonight, the Council has Marcella Rodriguez on the Zoom broadcast for any residents who may need interpretation services from Spanish to English. Participants on the Zoom may also view Spanish captioning by selecting the closed caption button at the bottom of their Zoom screens. This will be a button marked as CC in capital letters. Now I'm gonna go ahead and toss it to Marcela to explain this. Marcela. Thank you, Jordan. Este programa se está traduciendo al español para los participantes en Zoom. Puede acceder a este recurso seleccionando el botón CC en la parte inferior de su pantalla de Zoom. Jordan, back to you. Thank you, Marcella. Our first speaker tonight is Michael Knapp. Please unmute your microphone and you will have two minutes to provide your testimony when you are ready. Excellent, thank you very much. Good evening, it's great to be with you tonight. My name is Mike Knapp, I'm chair of the Montgomery College Board of Trustees. And like you, having gone through years with few budget resources and years like this one where there are seemingly more, the years with more can often be more difficult. So we at the college continue to demonstrate our commitment to fiscal prudence our budget grew the least of any county agency. In fact, our request this year only represents a 2.8% increase in our total budget, where every other county agency is requesting at least twice that percentage with increases ranging from 55 to 7%. Our request is simple and responsible. It asks you to invest in our employees and in our shared goal and MC presence in the, in the East County. Funds for these two county priorities are included in the executive's recommended budget. Our faculty and staff, without fanfare, remained agile and mission-focused throughout this public health crisis. They also agreed to forego pay raises for this current year. The board is grateful to our unions, AAUP, AFSCME, and SEIU for their sacrifice. We look to you to also acknowledge their commitment to fiscal prudence and affordability with an appropriation of $3.8 million for pay raises. This increase is affordable. An average 3.5% total wage adjustment is quite modest by all comparisons. This is GWA only, no additional increments or merit increases. With respect to East County, the council has long championed enhanced access for this underserved region. To finally make this a reality, 3.3 million is required. These funds will stand up an education center and cement our partnership with the county to develop a campus. Given that many low-income students are turning away from post-secondary education, we must hold tuition flat again and take additional measures to attract and build the workforce that will power our economy. Together, we can preserve tuition at its current level, stand up an East County Education Center, and invest in our most valuable resource, the faculty and staff who teach our students. Thank you, and many thanks to you outgoing council members. Know that you have changed lives and your legacy continues in those residents that you've impacted through Montgomery College. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Norma Martinez, who will be giving a testimony in Spanish. Norma, you have two minutes and you may begin when you are ready. Señora Norma, buenas noches. Tiene dos minutos para dar su testimonio. Cuando usted termine, yo voy a interpretar. Gracias. Señora Norma, ¿nos escucha? We have Norma here. Señora Ángeles, sé que usted está dando el testimonio en place de Norma. Okay. Yes, he's here. Okay, hello. Um, gracias. 
Hola, mi nombre es Ángeles Pichardo, soy promotora de salud voluntaria por más de 15 años y mi testimonio en esta noche es el siguiente. Durante mi trabajo como promotora de salud, no solo he tenido la oportunidad de ver de cerca la necesidad que nuestra comunidad latina tiene de acceder a servicios de salud y servicios sociales, sino también la necesidad de nuestra comunidad tiene de promotores de salud como nos, somos nosotros. Nosotros les ayudamos a conectarse con dichos servicios como comida, servicios de salud física y mental y ayuda para la renta y utilidades. A través de nuestro alcance, educación y referencia, nosotros facilitamos el acceso a los servicios de nuestra, que nuestra comunidad necesita. Nuestra comunidad siempre ha tenido mucha necesidad que creció de forma exponencial durante la pandemia. Como respuesta a estas necesidades, se crearon nuevos programas que facilitaron el acceso y los servicios llegaron a nuestra comunidad. Actualmente yo estoy apoyando en el programa por nuestra salud y bienestar que dirige la Iniciativa Latina de Salud y que ha ayudado a muchas personas en nuestro condado. Así que esta noche quiero pedirle que por favor incluya en su presupuesto del próximo año fiscal 2023 un incremento de fondos para la Iniciativa Latina de Salud. Quiero pedirle que ese presupuesto adicional que se destinó para la creación de nuevos programas durante la pandemia y que facilitó nuestra comunidad pudiera acceder a muchas ayudas como comida, asistencia para la renta, pago de utilidades, atención médica y muchas cosas más, quede establecido de manera permanente para ayudar a cerrar la brecha que existe en el acceso a los servicios por parte de la comunidad latina. Necesitamos seguir contando con estos programas, aun cuando ya no estemos en pandemia. Me siento muy orgullosa de vivir en un condado en el cual sus representantes escuchan a sus residentes y toman acciones en beneficio de ellos. También me siento muy orgullosa de ser parte de programas por, como el programa Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, que ayuda a mejorar la calidad de vida de las personas. Muchas gracias por su atención a mi testimonio. Buenas noches y las promotoras de salud del condado de Montgomery somos lo mejor de lo mejor. Gracias. Hello, my name is Angeles Pichardo. I have been a volunteer health promoter for more than 15 years and my testimony tonight is as follows. During my work as, as a health promoter, I have not only had the opportunity to see up close our Latino community needs to access health and social services, but also the needs for health promoters like myself to help them connect to services such as food, physical and mental services and rent and utility assistance. Through our outreach, education, and referrals, we facilitate access to the services our community needs. Our community has always had a great amount of needs, which grew exponentially during the pandemic. In response to those needs, new programs were created that facilitated access to services that could reach our community. I am currently supporting the Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar program run by the Latino Health Initiative which has helped so many people. So tonight, I want to ask you to please include in your budget for the next fiscal year 2023 an increase in funding for the Latino Health Initiative. I want to ask that the additional budget that was allocated for creation of new programs during the pandemic and that, was, and that made it easier for our community to access many aids such as food, rental assistance, payment utilities, medical attentions, and many other things be permanently established to help close the gap in access to services by the Latino community. We need to continue to have these programs even if we are no longer in a pandemic. I am very proud to live in a county whose representatives listen to their residents and take action on their behalf. I also feel very, very proud to be a part of a program such as Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar that helps, that helps improve people's quality of life. Thank you very much for your attention to my testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Charlene Lucas. Charlene, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Hucker, Vice President Glass, and members of the council. My name is Charlene Lucas and I'm here to speak about my organization, Sister Circles, a group I established to address the needs of pre pregnant women who have nowhere to turn. I'm here to ask for your help in funding this project and in-kind services. I have submitted my written testimony and will summarize the most important points. 
I have provided stories about two women who were helped through our efforts. I plan on providing that help by enlisting a group of people capable of listening to their needs, supporting them, and helping them address those needs. I want to be able to advocate for them as a group. Sister Circles will offer them that support through partnerships that will offer assistance through healthy nutrition, regular medical exams, exercise, food security, job opportunities, dress to impress, education and training, computer training, financing, and clothing. Thank you for allowing me to introduce Sister Circles to you. I look forward to your support and helping in funding the project of in-kind services. My mission, my, pur my purpose, my passion. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Sonia Roberts. Sonia, you have two minutes to give your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. Do we have Sonia Roberts here? Yes, right here. I'm sorry. No problem. Good evening. Good evening, Council President Albernaz and members of the Council. My name is Sonia Roberts, and I'm chair of the Montgomery County Library Board. We ask that the council support the executive budget, um, the executive's budget recommendations for fiscal year 2023 for Montgomery County Public Libraries. After two years of the pandemic, MCPL will use these resources to rebuild and to reach out. The biggest rebuild involves staffing with a vacancy rate over 20%. With these resources, MCPL's leadership expects to have branch level vacancies resolved early next fiscal year and management level vacancies a bit later. We also ask the council to review the county's personnel procedures. Perhaps some adjustments can alleviate these shortages more quickly. We were disappointed that the executive did not approve MCPL's request for $320,000 to strengthen the Spanish and Chinese language collections. Our Latino and Chinese populations are growing. We ask that the council add these funds. We see this initiative as part of the larger outreach effort the MCPL is undertaking in response to needs the pandemic revealed. For instance, we now know how important MCPL computers and Wi-Fi networks are to many of our residents. This led to enhanced Wi-Fi access in the parking lots and underlined the urgency of reopening as the terminals in the branches are vital to many. With generous support from the council over the last two difficult years, our library workers and leadership have found innovative ways to keep our libraries, resources, and programs available to all of our residents. These dedicated public servants are now ready to rebuild and reach out. Please give them the resources to do so. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Mayra Alvaro. Mayra will be giving a testimony in Spanish. You may begin when you are ready. You have two minutes. Thank you. Señora Mayra tendrá dos minutos para dar su testimonio. Cuando se concluya, voy a interpretar. Gracias. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Mayra Alvarado. Soy residente del condado de Montgomery en la ciudad de Gaithersburg. Conociendo sus buenas labores y actividades, me dirijo a ustedes muy respetuosamente para exponerle mi caso y solicitarle la mayor ayuda posible. Él es mi hijo. Mi petición es solicitar programas que incluyan el cuidado personal para los niños con necesidades especiales que aún usan diaper y personas capacitadas que hablen español para trabajar juntos con los padres de una manera responsable y respetuosa sin ningún tipo de discriminación. Soy madre de un niño con ese tipo de necesidad, diagnosticado con autismo a los dos años, ahora él tiene 12 y aún continúa usando diaper. Por esa razón, nunca me lo han aceptado en los programas de recreación que el condado ofrece. Siempre que pregunto por los campamentos de verano o actividades después de la escuela, lo único que me dicen es, lo siento, no tenemos ese departamento de cuidado personal o las personas no están capacitadas para ese recurso solicitado. Necesitamos del apoyo de ustedes porque hay familias como la mía de escasos recursos que no podemos pagar estos costosos programas y las aplicaciones de asistencia financiera son complicadas o limitadas y no siempre es claro lo que ofrecen como ayuda. De acuerdo con las estadísticas escolares, 
hay aproximadamente más de 20.000 estudiantes con una discapacidad. Así pues, pido la mayor atención posible a este caso y poder agilizar esta petición de modo que se pueda lograr el objetivo de aprobar estos recursos para el apoyo y desarrollo físico y emocional de estos jóvenes. Porque esto beneficiará no solo a mi familia, sino a muchas familias del condado de Montgomery. Gracias por escucharme y espero una respuesta positiva. Buenas noches. Good evening. My name is Mayra Alvarado. I am a resident of Montgomery County in the city of Gatorsburg. Since I know of your good work and activities, I address you today very respectfully to expose my case and request. My request is to add programs that include care for children with special needs, including those who still use diapers, and include trained people who speak Spanish to work together with parents in a responsible and respectful manner without any discrimination. I am the mother of a child with this type of need, diagnosed with autism at age two. Now he is 12 and still using diapers. For that reason, I have never been accepted into the recreation programs that the county offers. Whenever I ask about summer camps or after school activities, the only thing that they tell me is, we are sorry, we do not have the personnel, the personal care in that department or that people are not trained for that requested resource. We need your support because there are low income families like mine who cannot afford these expensive programs. And the financial assistance applications are very complicated or limited in scope. And it is not always clear what they offer us help. According to school statistics, there are approximately more than 20,000 students with disabilities. Therefore, I ask the greatest possible attention be given to cases like the one of my family and to be able to expedite this request so that objectives of approving these resources for the support in physical and emotional development of these young people can be achieved because this will benefit not only my family but also many families in Montgomery County. Thank you for listening and I look forward to a positive response. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Jordan, just, just really quick, sorry. Um, Señor Alvarado, vamos a ponernos en contacto con, contigo porque um, el Departamento de Recreación tiene que ofrecer esos programas para tu joven. Uh, yo fui el director por 12 años, así que vamos a um, evaluar su caso y a ver qué es lo que podemos hacer uh, porque esto no es justo. <laughs> así que vamos a ponernos en contacto contigo. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Sandra Landis. Sandra, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council President Albernaz, members of the County Council and others here tonight. My name is Sandra Landis and I am the Montgomery County Chapter Leader of Start School Later. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I am here tonight first to applaud the action the County Council took this week to add $8 million in funding to establish wellness centers in every MCPS high school to help combat the teen mental health crisis. As we look for and invest heavily in ways to address this, the importance of finding a way to establish healthy school bell times in this county for our teenagers should not be overlooked. Establishing leader bell times is fundamental to middle and high school students' mental and physical health and well-being. The National Sleep Foundation, U.S. Surgeon General, American Academy of Pediatrics, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as most medical groups in the country, recommend that secondary school start times begin no earlier than 8.30 a.m. due to biological changes that occur in adolescents when teens need for sleep to support their emerging higher-level brain functions increase, but their onset of sleep is delayed. I am here tonight to encourage you to build on your recent action by also funding a comprehensive transportation study by an outside expert to evaluate all our transportation options in order to craft a cost-effective solution that could leverage our robust ride-on and metro bus assets, as well as our fleet of yellow school buses. By leveraging all our resources and by following the science, as we did in our response to COVID, we can better ensure the safety and well-being of our entire school community. In this regard, I am echoing the request made by the MCCPTA Health and Wellness Committee to you last month to allocate funds to conduct such a study. I hope we can count on your leadership and activism to ensure that when we are not building wellness centers with one hand to combat a problem that we are causing with the other, 
but rather that these centers will be used to address the needs of our teens and adolescents that can't be solved or avoided by simply allowing them to sleep. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Daisy Thompson. Daisy, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. We have Daisy Thompson. Greetings, County Council. My name is Daisy Thompson, and my ask is that funds be earmarked to start an initiative or expand a current program like the Jewish Council, Council for the Aging to include non competitive virtual work from home jobs for disabled seniors and retired professionals. The COVID 19 pandemic has shown us that it is possible to work virtually. According to the Census Bureau, 30% of persons receiving government assistance were persons with disabilities. In 2021, persons with a disability accounted for 11.9% of the population. Persons with a disability tend to be older than persons with no disability. Current programs do not take into consideration work history or education level and are not virtual. Most are supported employment programs. Therefore, virtual jobs would eliminate travel costs, physical exertion, and allow those who cannot work in an office set setting a chance to work. Because older workers have strong work ethics and are dependable. In conclusion, Senator Chris Van Hollen agrees with me and believes we should do more to expand opportunities, reduce barriers, and increase investments in programs that support people with disabilities, retired workers, and seniors to get back to work. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Valerie Island Davis. Valerie, you have two minutes to give your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. My daughter is a brilliant black MCPS high school student. She's no longer able to learn inside her school building because she's afraid. We recently decided that she will finish school outside of her school building virt virtually and at home, separated from classmates and teachers and forfeiting the advanced instruction opportunity she deserves. The straw that broke our backs was the latest reported incident of sexual assault at her school. It was the latest in a string of experiences that began when she was the only witness who came forward to report a BB gun incident during the first month of school. Since then, more incidents and police presence have stoked anxiety and left many questions unanswered about how our children are being kept safe and made to feel safe at school. Here are three numbers that I hope will compel you you to invest in four available preventive school safety measures. 87. This school year alone, there have been 87 serious incidents in her high school, including nine drug incidents and five sexual incidents. 400. The ratio of students to security staff in our high schools is routinely as high as one student to 400. One uh, security and uh, staff member to 400 students, and that is too high to be considered safe. And then 50,000, over 50,000 high school students have required IDs, IDs that we used in lunch lines, but we don't use them for school entry. So I'm requesting the following four investments in high schools where most serious incidents occur. Number one, security staff. Hire staff to achieve a ratio of one to 150 in all high schools by next year. Two, ID scanning technology. Invest in scanners at all high school entrances and exits. Three, cameras and monitoring. Invest in complete camera coverage indoors and outdoors at high schools and establish dedicated camera monitoring stations instead of laptops with limited camera displays. And four, establish a Health and Human Services Agency Standing Committee on School Safety that reviews serious and non-serious incident data across MCPS monthly. Please take action to prioritize major safety and security investments now so that this brilliant black girl and all of our children can be safe and feel safe in the schools that are their homes away from home. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Julia Diaz who will be giving a testimony in Spanish. Julia, you have two minutes to give your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Señora Julia tiene dos minutos para dar su testimonio. Gracias. Gracias. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Julia Díaz. Quiero agradecer al Consejo por la oportunidad que me da de poder compartir mi testimonio. Y se trata sobre los casos de abuso y acoso sexual que hay en las escuelas. Hace casi dos años mi hija fue a Pre-K con toda la emoción del mundo. Ella ha sido una niña muy alegre, extrovertida y creativa. A medida pasaron los días, 
ella cambió de actitud, se volvió tímida, andaba siempre triste, distraída, enojada y desobediente. Yo hablaba con ella, pero ella no me decía nada. Cuando le pregunté a la maestra cómo ella se portaba, ella respondió, oh, su hija es maravillosa. Eso me dejó más tranquila, pero aún así yo le comenté a ella el mal comportamiento de mi hija en casa. Yo tenía casi tres meses de haber dado a luz y entonces la maestra me dijo que estos podían ser celos de la niña y que me la iba a referir con la trabajadora de la escuela, pero no funcionó nada. En octubre mi hija me, comen me comentó que un niño de cinco años la besaba y le tocaba partes privadas y que ella le había dicho a su maestra, pero que la maestra le dijo que era un niño que solo jugaba. Volví a hablar con la maestra, me dijo que era cierto y me dijo que era un niño cariñoso. El comportamiento de mi hija empeoró, entonces yo busqué ayuda con la directora de la escuela, a lo que ella respondió que Priquei no estaba bajo su responsabilidad porque es un programa gubernamental para personas de bajos recursos que si a mí no me gustaba que sacara a mi hija de la escuela. Me pareció inapropiado e incompetente por parte de ella, ya que como líder debería de tener la capacidad para enfrentar estos problemas. Gracias a Dios encontré ayuda sin el, sin el apoyo de la escuela con Luis Center y Trihau me apoyaron. Y yo le pido a, los, a las escuelas que capaciten, que, que capaciten al personal para que ellos puedan responder adecuadamente ante una petición de los padres y alumnos y también poner centros de apoyo para ayudar a las familias como la mía. Doy mi testimonio para que los padres estén más alerta ante algún cambio de actitud de parte de sus hijos. Muchas gracias por su atención. Buenas noches. Hello, my name is Julia Díaz. I want to thank the council for this opportunity to present my testimony about cases of sexual abuse and harassment in the schools. Almost two years ago, my daughter went to pre-kindergarten with uh, all of the excitement in the world. She has always been a very happy, outgoing, and creative girl. As the days passed, her attitude changed, and she became sh shy, sad, distracted, and her behavior was one of disobedience and anger. I talked to her, but she didn't want to say anything to me. And when I asked the, te the teacher how she behaved, she replied, your daughter is wonderful. That made me feel more at ease. But even so, I told her about my daughter's bad behavior at home. I had given birth about three months prior, and the teacher told me that my daughter could be experiencing jealousy. The teacher said she was going to refer her to the social school worker, but nothing worked. That October, my daughter told me that a five-year-old boy was kissing her and touching her private parts, and that she had already told her teacher, but that the teacher told her that the boy was just playing. I spoke to the teacher again, and she told me that it was true, uh, but that he was just a loving boy. My daughter's behavior continued to worsen, and she arrived home several times beaten by another child and with bruises. I looked for help and support with the school director, with the principal, but she told me that pre-K was not under her responsibility because it is a government program for low-income families, and that if I didn't like it, uh, I could take my daughter out of the school. This seemed completely inappropriate and absurd to me, since as the leader of the school, she should have the capacity to face these issues. Thank God that I finally found the resources to help my daughter overcome the trauma she experienced. And I want to be clear, without the help of the school, places like Lori Center and Tree House supported me and gave me what we needed to get through this experience with my daughter. I asked the schools train their staff so that they can respond to these types of requests from parents and students. In addition, I ask you to set up more support centers to families and like mine. And I also give my testimony tonight because it is my wish that no one else has to go through what I went through with my daughter and that parents are alert to any changes in attitudes of their children. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Iris Carlo. Iris, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Greetings, Council President Albornoz, Council Vice President Glass, and members of the, count the County Council. My name is Iris Carlo, and I have been a Montgomery County resident for the past 23 years in Germantown and Rockville. 
I am here today, um, or on Zoom today, uh, to ask that the council allot funding to centers that can provide reduced cost care to help families um, and aid working families in Montgomery County out of poverty. As a young single mother, I experienced a great challenge when planning for childcare for my toddler son. I earned what I thought was a good amount of money in 2012, $16 an hour. I quickly learned that the majority of my earnings would have to go towards childcare costs. This made me feel so defeated and I questioned what the point of working was. I spent all of my time away from my baby for a small financial gain. And I applied for a special program that assisted mothers in need with daycare stipends but this lasted one month. I received a letter stating that the funds for the program had depleted and I would no longer receive the stipend. I was in a position where I had a financial responsibility to cover and I felt so unhappy with my life circumstances. I had to struggle during this time with the choice to be a working mother or stay at home living in poverty. I felt I couldn't work, couldn't go to school because I couldn't afford it. I even contemplated hiring an unlicensed provider at one point. This is a common issue that many women with children in Montgomery County face. In Washington, D.C., there is a daycare or preschool program that only works with income qualified families, charging them a fraction of the typical cost of a daycare. There's no stipend, just direct funding to the school with a reduced monthly cost to families. An example of a center like this is Centronia. I'm asking the council to allocate funds in the budget to support community-based childcare centers like Centronia, which provide an essential service to many families. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Dr. Christine Handy. Dr. Christine Handy, Dr. Handy, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, members of the County Council. I am Christine Handy, president of the Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals, MACAP. Our organization represents over 760 Montgomery County public schools educational leaders who serve in administrative and supervisory positions in schools and essential services. <clears throat> Rising up after the pandemic has been challenging. <clears throat> from contact tracing to in-school testing to mask on, mask off, from no spectators to unlimited spectators at events and supporting students and staff's social and emotional well-being. Our leaders have been pivoting all year to serve our school community with excellence. It has transformed the way that we work, communicate, meet, navigate our community, and how we lead. As we rise up, Dr. McKnight has submitted a budget for MCPS that embraces both innovation and equity and the needs of our schools. It includes a virtual academy, much needed anti-racist work, reading specialists in elementary schools and a social emotional learning focus, well-being supports for student, students and staff and a general wage adjustment. The economic prosperity and strength of our community is tied to our school system. We must continue to fund our schools so that our students excel. Excellent schools attract residents and businesses to Montgomery County and keep them here. We must continue to fund adequate wages for employees. The cost of living is steadily increasing and it would be great if more of our employees could afford to live in the county where they work. MCAP supports MCPS Board of Education's operating budget and are appreciative that the county executive has subsequently presented an operating budget that funds 99% of the Board of Education and Superintendent's request. We all believe that the children of Montgomery County deserve the highest quality education possible, delivered by highly trained and skilled adults and led by highly effective leaders. Our employees are our most valuable asset to improving student achievement. Thus, we must continue to adequately fund education in Montgomery County, Maryland, in a manner that upholds our beliefs and fundamental values. Thank you for your continued support and commitment to education and our schools. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Up next, we have Pia Morrison. Pia, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Good evening, Council President Albernose, Council Vice President Glass, and all members of the County Council. Can you hear me now? Better? Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Sorry. Good evening, Council, Council President Albernose, Council Vice President Glass, and all members of the County Council. On behalf of the members of SEIU Local 500, I would like to thank each of you for your extraordinary work during this ongoing pandemic. As you know, SEIU Local 500 represents more than 20,000 members, more than 9,000 of whom are supporting service professionals at MCPS. 
Our members perform a wide variety of jobs, both student-facing and supporting the infrastructure of MCPS. SEIU Local 500 is a union of educators, nonprofit workers, and caregivers. We are all invested in the strength and vitality of our local public schools. I come before you today on behalf of all of our members to enthusiastically endorse the proposed budget set forth by the county executive and respectfully ask the council to fund it fully. The budget request is $117.4 million over maintenance of effort and almost $150 million over last year's budget request for MCPS. Our outstanding members at MCPS have never worked harder, both on the front lines and behind the scenes. Last year, they transitioned to teach remotely, distributed millions of meals to children in need, delivered Chromebooks, and provided the technical and logistical support to make virtual learning possible. While working successfully with teachers, our paraeducator members helped make distance learning effective. Our members at MCPS have gone above and beyond for the children and families of Montgomery County, and this budget recognizes their efforts and accounts for their needs. However, we have seen support staff professionals leave a profession that they love due to low pay and overwork over the past year. We can and need to do better for our staff, students, and families of Montgomery County. In May, you have an opportunity to begin the process of addressing these concerns by passing this budget. We will continue to work with MCPS, the Board of Education, the County Executive, you, and state leaders on addressing the needs of our school system and fantastic support staff professionals. I thank all of you for your hard work and reaffirm this and support the members for this budget. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Jennifer Martin. Jennifer, you have two minutes to give your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good evening, Council President Albernaz, Council Vice President Glass, and Council members. The Montgomery County Education Association is grateful that you and the County Executive intend to fund a historic MCPS budget to support the continued excellence of our public schools and to provide the resources needed to help students and staff overcome the hardships we've experienced over the past two years. This reinvestment in our public schools is long overdue. Educators and MCPS support staff have been crushed by workloads created by persistent short staffing and ever-increasing demands. Burnout resulting from overwork and underfunding has led to an increasing number of staff resigning or retiring from MCPS each year. And these problems negatively affect families' connection to the school, community, student well-being, and academic success. As of this week, over, uh, there are 1,443 MCPS employees who've notified the system of their resignation or retirement versus a total of 832 at this time last year. And the school year is not over yet. Meanwhile, colleges and universities here and across the country are seeing drastically fewer students pursuing teaching careers. Full funding of the county executive's proposed school budget will help us ensure that the system can provide wages, benefits, and working conditions that will attract and retain educators of the highest quality. Further, this budget will enable MCPS to address opportunity gaps and the growing need for mental health services for our students. It will expand our community schools program and build bridges for family engagement. Employees in MCPS are counting on you to approve this budget that restores respect for the dignity of the work we do. Our students and their families are counting on you to provide the funding for the strong schools they deserve. The future prosperity and livability of our county depends on your commitment to investing in our public schools, and we thank you for the support that you will provide. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Michelle Gluck. Uh, Michelle, you have two minutes to give your testimony. I'm sorry, Michelle Glick. You have two minutes to give your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Michelle Glick, and I chair the MCCPTA Curriculum Committee. I'm here to ask you to fully fund the MCPS budget. No surprise there. We appreciate and are grateful that for the proposed budget that goes over and above MOE. We also believe that there's an urgent need to fund two curriculum needs in the coming fiscal year that I want to highlight. One is the development and expansion of the virtual academy. The second, which is not in the budget but should be, is to repopulate the central office of curriculum and instructional programs so that it can promote the equitable delivery of instruction across all MCPS schools. We applaud the development of the virtual academy to allow students to learn outside their assigned school buildings. 
The virtual academy could become the silver lining of the pandemic by creating a structure for students at underserved schools to benefit from the expertise of teachers or critical mass of students at other schools. We hope that this and future budgets will sustain and expand the virtual academy to promote equitable learning opportunities across the entire county. We also feel that this budget is missing critical components that should be funded. Years of budget pressures have significantly reduced the ability of the curriculum office to develop, implement, and monitor the efficacy of curriculum. OSIP needs mission critical specialist positions to be restored in several areas where positions have been cut. Just a few examples of these areas include the two-way immersion programs, the world languages programs, the career readiness and certification programs, and the division of accelerated and enriched instruction. This budget also lacks funding for evaluation of curriculum. This is my 16th year as an MCPS parent and advocate. I have repeatedly been told that there was no money in the budget to collect or analyze data on the many promising but unproven curricula and interventions that we try out in schools. We end up evaluating all of them based solely on test scores. Instruction is highly variable across the county. This is not equitable, it is not fair, and it is most damaging to our most vulnerable populations. Please consider funding more oversight for curriculum fidelity and equity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Sian Duncan. Sian, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Montgomery County Council. It is an honor to speak to you tonight. My name is Sian Duncan and I attend Montgomery College at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus. I'm an international student from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm here to ask you to support Montgomery College's operating budget request, which will keep tuition affordable for students like me. At MC, I'm a student senator, a member of the Honor Society, and a business major. After completing my associate's degree, I plan to transfer to the new project management bachelor's degree. I am proud to be the second person in my family to attend college. My uncle, with whom I now reside in Silver Spring, was the first. He's also a Montgomery College alum. I chose to attend MC because it is affordable. Like many of my fellow students, without MC, I would not have been able to pursue a degree and college would have been out of reach for me. Now more than ever, MC students are in desperate need of keeping tuition affordable or many will have to cut their college aspirations short. Due to the pandemic, many of my peers are in great need as they have lost their jobs and are unable to pay their rent or even buy groceries. Because of your support throughout the pandemic, the college has not had to raise tuition. Students have come to count on affordability, especially now that costs are increasing for basic things like food and transportation. With your continued support, the college can keep tuition affordable. I also want to thank you for the Leggett Math and Science building on our campus. I speak for all when I say that we can't wait. We're also grateful you are supporting the TPSS library renovation. We appreciate your long-standing support of our college. You have ensured like, that countless students like my uncle and me can pursue their dreams. We need your continued help. Please support MC's operating budget request so that students like me and those I represent can afford the education they need. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your continuous support of my college and my home, Montgomery College. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Lady Mendoza. Lady will be giving a testimony in Spanish. You have two minutes and you may begin when you are ready. Gracias. Um, buenas noches, Presidente del Concejal Albornoz y miembros del Concejal. Mi nombre es Lady Mendoza. Mi hijo asiste a Wheaton Good Elementary School y soy parte de Action en Montgomery. Quiero agradecer a la Concejal Navarro por su trabajo en la educación temprana. Y quiero agradecer al concejal Rice que participó en las recomendaciones del Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Ustedes han abierto la puerta para el proyecto de Pre-K Universal. Hoy quiero que ustedes tomen los próximos pasos para que todos los niños que tienen cuatro años puedan asistir Pre-K por gratis. Para empezar, quiero pedirles que aumenten el número de cupos de Pre-K con este presupuesto, incluso los cupos de Head Start que aumenten las horas para que Pre-K sea tiempo completo y que el currículum de Pre-K esté enfocado en el bienestar socioemocional del niño. Que también cambien los requisitos para calificar para el subsidio. Cuando mi hijo tenía cuatro meses, yo tenía que buscar trabajo 
eh, y tenía que cuidar, eh, que buscar quien cuidara a mi hijo. Encontré un daker, pero cobraban 420 la semana. Me enteré del subsidio y reuní los papeles, pero la persona que me recibió me preguntó si yo trabajaba y yo respondí que no. Entonces su respuesta fue que si yo no trabajaba, yo podía cuidarlo. En los requisitos también había la posibilidad de que no calificáramos por el salario de mi esposo. Él tenía dos trabajos para poder pagar la casa y las utilidades y aún así no um, cubríamos todas nuestras necesidades. Por eso yo quería empezar a trabajar, pero um, en las sesiones de escuchas me enteré que no era la única en esa situación. Uno se siente en el limbo y es impotente querer trabajar y no poder. Pero si pre que fuera gratis, um, las madres podríamos conseguir trabajo y los niños podrían salir adelante. Espero que ustedes consideren empezar pre que Universal y muchas gracias por su tiempo. Good evening, Council President Albornoz, a member of the County Council. My name is Lady Mendoza. I am a proud parent at Wheaton Woods Elementary School, a member of the PTA and a leader with action in Montgomery. <clears throat> I want to thank that I want to thank Council Member Navarro for her tireless work on early childhood education, and I want to thank Council Member Rice, who also helped me shape the pre-K recommendations from the blueprint for Maryland's future. You have both worked to lay the foundation for what I am going to ask for tonight, which is a path to universal pre-K. Today, I want to ask you to take the next steps so that all four years old can attend pre-K for free. But to begin, I would like you to consider, number one, expanding the number of seats for pre-K, number two, expanding hours of pre-K to full-time, number three, a requirement of play-based and social-emotional curriculum, and number four, changing the qualifications requirements for pre-K uh, subsidies. When my son was four months old, I had to find childcare because I wanted to work. I found a place, but it cost $420 each week. I heard about the subsidy program, organized my paperwork, but the person who assisted me asked if I worked. Her response was that if I did not work, then I would not qualify. Given the requirements, there was also the possibility of us not qualifying based on income. Well, my husband worked two jobs to be able to make rent, uh, to be able to make the rent and utility payments. What he earned wasn't enough to cover all the cost, food, diapers, milk for the baby. It's, this is why I wanted to work and why I needed a child care. I attend listening sessions and one day I heard that I was not the only one facing this situation. One feels like one of them felt like she was in the limbo. One feel another one feels powerless when one wants to work but can't. But if pre-K was free, the mothers will not have wouldn't have to be able to find work while our children thrive. In this budget, I hope that you will consider taking steps towards universal pre-K. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have James Olson. James, you have two minutes to give your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Uh, good evening, President Albernoz and members of the council. My name is James Olson, and I'm testifying tonight on behalf of Action in Montgomery, or AIM. AIM is a broad-based community power organization founded in 1998 and rooted in Montgomery County's neighborhoods and congregations. Every year, AIM conducts extensive listening sessions within its member organizations, and every year, including this year, the need for affordable housing comes up as a prime concern. This is consistent with Broader data showing that even before the pandemic, half of tenants in Montgomery County were cost burdened. Cost, COVID has made this situation even more challenging, particularly for low income households and communities of color. Given these needs, AIM supports the budget recommendation of approximately $100 million in the operating and capital budgets for the preservation and development of affordable housing. This includes 40 million for the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing. But in fact, the county would need to budget more than this amount for affordable housing production to meet the targets identified in the 2019 Council of Governments report 
which the council has unanimously indicated it supports. In addition to affordable housing production, AIM supports the 38.1 million in the budget targeted for housing support for low income households. AIM also requests that the county allocate 20 million in ARPA funds to housing. As one concrete measure to further these goals, AIM also strongly recommends that the council act to ensure that the provision in the capital budget for a refresh of the Chevy Chase Library be amended to provide for a redevelopment of the library with housing. That housing should be at least 30% below market, including provision of units for households making 50% or less of the county's AMI. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Rosemary Wilson. Rosemary, you have two minutes to give your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, good. Good evening, council members. My name is Rosemary Wilson, and I am the owner of Flower Coffee Collective, a mobile coffee shop operating in Long Branch in Silver Spring. And I'm testifying in support of funding to maintain business support services for small businesses impacted by Purple Line construction, as well as becoming a Main Street. Flower Coffee began out of an effort to add to the current neighborhood business district and become a part of building the community I wanted to be a part of. I knew that coffee and food are great uniters of people and saw the desire for specialty coffee offerings that weren't yet available. Purple Line construction has been a constant fixture in Long Branch since the project broke ground in 2017. Currently, construction activity is focused on Piney Branch Road and is directly in front of some storefronts with sidewalks closed and access to business limited. Flower Coffee is fortunate to be mobile and to have low rent costs, but most of our fellow business owners in Long Branch do not have that luxury. We love being a part of the Long Branch community and we want to be here long enough to see the Purple Line open, but many small businesses in Long Branch will be tested in the coming years as construction activity increases. I was very intentional in joining this neighborhood and this business district and cautious to build a business that, which complemented rather than competed with those around me. I want this diverse and unique community to flourish rather than be pushed out. The Main Street Initiative has been hugely successful in other business districts and becoming a Main Street would help us immensely to grow and become stronger. Thankfully, community organizations like LEDC and MHP are providing services to small businesses in Long Branch to attract more potential customers to the area and mitigate against the loss of business associated with Purple Line construction. MHP helped me from the beginning stages of development of my idea, connecting me to other business owners, assisting me with grants, helping us with marketing and signage, and bringing our community together. Several years ago, the council appropriated funding to MHP and LEDC to provide these services, but the funding has been exhausted because it assumed a 2022 opening for the Purple Line. As a result, we are requesting additional funding to enable the, these organizations to continue providing business support services to us and other businesses impacted by the Purple Line construction. Thank you for your consideration and support of small business. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Bob Golden. We got some word that Bob might not be here. Just for the record, Bob Golden. Okay, up next, we have Susanna Madrid. Susanna will be giving a testimony in Spanish. You have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Señora Susana nos escucha, tendrá dos minutos para dar su testimonio. Susana Madrid. Señora Susana, ¿nos escucha? Me la laquearon. Le, la escuchamos. ¿Aló? La escuchamos. Puede dar su testimonio y trabajaremos en el video. No miro ahorita. Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Susana Madrid y hoy quiero compartir que hay mucha necesidad en el condado de Montgomery, sobre todo para la comodidad latina. Hay mucha necesidad para ayudar a los ancianos, sobre todo a los ancianos que están enfermos. Mucha gente como yo quedó sin trabajo y andaba necesitada, anda necesitada ya que muchos nos enfermamos del COVID-19 y aún así estamos sufriendo las consecuencias 
las consecuencias del COVID. Um, a mí, por lo menos, el COVID me dejó con los tendones y los nervios muy dañados. No he podido trabajar, no he podido conseguir uh, un trabajo para poder comer ni comprar por lo menos una lata de frijol, unas comidas, medicina. No sé, ahorita se me está haciendo difícil hablar por motivo de que yo me quedé muy nerviosa. Tuve mucha depresión después de esto. Y me pongo a pensar en la demás gente del condado de Montgomery, que es, eh, tiene mucha necesidad, está muy enferma. Y pues uh, hay mucha, mucha gente que ha pedido ayuda y ahorita pues acaba de morir un, un amigo mío que pidió ayuda y dijeron que no, no tenían porque se les estaba acabando. Él tenía mucha necesidad, murió hace como ocho días y pues murió en la calle porque no tenía para renta, no tenía para comida. Me duele mucho en el alma porque él pidió ayuda y nunca le pudieron ayudar. Pues espero que a partir de este tiempo ya exista un poco de ayuda en el condado de Montgomery. Aunque siempre, siempre, perdón. Tranquila, señora, no hay problema. Estoy muy nerviosa. Sí, tranquila. Sí, porque siempre hemos tenido necesidad, mucha gente, y a veces por ser latinos, nos discriminan, no nos ayudan en ninguna parte. Yo me quedé sin vivienda, yo me quedé sin vivienda cuando yo tenía el COVID, me echaron a la calle. Nadie quería darme donde vivir. Hubo una amiga que me ayudó, incluso esa amiga está muy enferma ahorita, no sé qué tendrá, tiene diabetes, pero no sé si ya está en la tapa, no sé qué, pero ella está muy hinchada, ella necesita mucha ayuda ahorita, sobre todo, y da mucha tristeza todo esto, porque uno no, yo no tengo quien me ayude, no tengo, mi propia familia me tiró a la calle, no tenía comida, no tenía nada y este, este grupo me pudo ayudar y solo así yo pude comer, yo pude buscar dónde vivir, yo me pude vestir y ahora si esta, si esta ayuda se acaba, no sabemos qué va a ser de nosotros. Discúlpeme, pero no puedo seguir hablando. No se preocupe, señora, no hay problema, yo voy a interpretar lo que usted ha dicho, ¿ok? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Susana Madrid, and today I want to share with you that there are many great needs in Montgomery County, especially for the Lat Latino community. There is great need to help the elderly, especially those who are sick. Many people like me lost their job and are still in need. Most of us got sick with COVID-19 and still suffer from the persistent symptoms. As part of these system, symptoms, I get panic attacks, so I still haven't been able to return to work. This means that sometimes I don't even have enough money to buy milk, a loaf of bread, and can of beans, much less to buy meat. And sometimes I don't even have money to buy medicines. I need medication for my feet and my spine. Uh, if the organizations funded by the county did not help us, everything will be terrible. Without this help, we would not have food to eat during the pandemic nor today. It would be a shame if we didn't continue to help those people who need these resources. Uh, I also have a friend who died, did not have a home, and I know a lot of people that are suffering from this pandemic. We need someone to listen to us. Montgomery County is a tough place to live for, to live for all of us who are low, low income. Rents are increasing, food prices are increasing, everything is increasing, and there 
are so many people who are sick and cannot work or that do not have anybody to help them like myself because I don't have anybody to help me. Our children also do not have recreational places to entertain themselves so as not to wander in the streets. Many people also continue to go through an economic crisis due to a pandemic and suffer from the lack of food, clothing, and medicine. Many of us are very sad and afraid to ask for help because we are rejected from being assisted in some places. We need a place where we can uh, count, a place where we can get help and help us find solutions to our problems. Many people can't go to clinics, to medical clinics, because they do not have money. They don't have a car. They don't have a way to get there because they don't, there's no free public transportation. And that's why they stay home even when they are sick. When I was in great need because I got sick with COVID, Montgomery County helped me. And I hope that as you have helped me, you can continue to help other people who are in need. There are adults, hungry children, mothers who cry and suffer who, because they don't have food to feed their families or buy them clothes, dresses. They don't have any money. And it would be very nice if those programs to assist our community continue. Please help our people we continue to suffer from COVID-19. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, have- Jordan, um, Councilmember Navarro would like to uh, address the our constituent that just spoke. Councilmember okay. Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, sí, señora Susana Madrid. Eh, vamos a hacer lo posible para, obviamente, ponernos en contacto con usted. Eh, vamos a pedirle a uh, a Marcela, que por favor ten, nos dé su información. Eh, y lo que quería era darle las gracias por su valentía de venir esta noche a compartir su experiencia, porque usted sabe que usted le está dando voz a muchas personas, eh, y eso es algo muy grande, eh, que usted ha tenido eh, esta, eh, ese tipo de valentía y que ha venido esta noche a compartir esto. Yo sé que hay mucha necesidad aún en nuestro condado y yo sé que todos queremos hacer lo posible para ofrecer algún tipo de asistencia eh, para evitar que este sufrimiento continúe. Eh, pero bueno, quería darle las gracias eh, a nombre de, de todos mis colegas eh, y, y, y vamos a ver cómo podemos contactarlos con ustedes directamente, pero sabemos de que sí necesitamos recursos para poder seguir ofreciendo asistencia eh, a los más necesitados. Muchas gracias. muchas gracias, muchas gracias. ¿Podría hablar una cosa más? Sí, señora, puede no, decir algo. Uh-huh. Con Jordan, can she say something else? Um, if there's possible, we can. Um, we have to move forward. If you can go ahead and say one more thing, that's fine. Um, but we do have to move forward. Thank you so much for the testimony. But yes, please. Okay, sí, señora, puede decir algo más y después, este, nos vamos a contactar con usted directamente para continuar la conversación. Está bien, ok, solamente que hace poco vino un niño aquí que no tiene mamá ni papá, se vino de Guatemala, él no tiene ayuda de nada, tiene 15 años y él no, no hace, no hayamos que hacer para que él pueda, él dice que quiere trabajar, pero no tiene, pero ni siquiera para cortarse el pelo, ni siquiera para vestirse casi, y yo quería ver si, por favor, pues, uh, existiría la ayuda para personas como ellos que vienen de por ahí, de los países de uno. Claro que. Vino a caer aquí en mi casa y pues no le podía decir no. She says that uh, a migrant children, well, he is 15 years old, came to her house knocking on the door. She, her mom and her daughter, not in the United States. He's asking for help, but uh, doesn't have food, uh, you know, doesn't have a place to stay. So she's just requesting help because he, he showed up at her house asking for assistance and would like to get additional assistance and would like to help this kid. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will definitely be following up with assistance. Uh, Susana, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Up next, we have Sara Lopez, who will also be giving a testimony in Spanish. Sara, you have two minutes to give your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. 
Señora Sara López, ¿nos escucha? Señora Sara López. Señora Susana, tengo entendido que usted le estaba ayudando a la señora Sara López, pero puede someter el testimonio por escrito, si es preferido. Ok, we will go ahead and uh, note that, and just in case Sara comes on, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next person in the meantime. Up next, we have Cheryl Lucas Giles. Cheryl, you have two minutes to give your testimony. And you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good evening, Council President Albernaz and Council members. I'm Dr. Cheryl Lucas Giles, a medical doctor who has practiced in the county for over 20 years. My testimony tonight is on behalf of myself and also on behalf of the 57 women in the Patuxent River, Maryland chapter of the Lynx Incorporated and our president, Mrs. Ann Everett. We are urging county council members to endorse full funding for the African American Health Program in the 2023 budget. AAHP plays a vital role in addressing health disparities in the African American community in important areas such as cardiovascular health and hypertension, diabetes, lung diseases, cancer, nutrition and obesity, maternal and child health, healthy lifestyle choices, stress recognition and reduction, and other areas, including seniors. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has further disproportionately challenged the health of African Americans and persons of color. AAHP has increased their services to address these persisting needs. Again, we are urging council members to approve full funding for the African American Health Program in the 2023 budget. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have uh, Charles Sims. Charles, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. We got word that Charles might not also be here. I can go ahead and note that. We'll move on to the next person. Up next, we have Seibel Brown. Seibel, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sybil Brown and I am the advocacy manager at Shepherd's Table in Silver Spring. Shepherd's Table has been around for 38 years, serving our homeless and food insecure population with hot meals, clothing, and other critical services. We are open every single day of the year, rain, snow, or shine, and have not missed a single day of meal service since our founding in 1983. Our executive director spoke to you in person at yesterday's hearings, but I wanted to follow up personally to provide another account on the life-saving work that we do. Most people that know of Shepherd's Table know of us for providing meals. However, in recent years, we have been expanding our programs and have added two social workers to our team to provide wraparound case management for people experiencing poverty. We believe it is time for the county to recognize these increased services through an increase in our contracted funding. I want to share with you a quick story of a mom and her 11-year-old son that our team met last month. This pregnant mom and her son have been homeless for several months with no luck of finding consistent food or shelter. The mom heard about Shepherd's Table through other people living on the streets, and even though she has been skeptical of receiving help from agencies in the past, they made their way over to us one night in desperate need of a hot meal. Our team quickly started a conversation with her and learned about their struggles. We jumped into action, and in partnership with the County Crisis Center, we secured a temporary hotel room for the mom and her child. In the past few weeks, since their first visit to our kitchen, they have come by multiple times a day for hot meals, clothing, and case management services. She has quickly learned that she can trust us and that our only motive here is to help her and her son. Our team is also working with her to find a job so that she can soon be eligible for permanent supportive housing. Due to our no barrier daily meal program, we are in a unique position to help members of our community that might otherwise be falling through the cracks. We believe that our daily hot meals serve as a pathway to creating trust and fostering open dialogue with the most vulnerable people in need that might otherwise be distrustful of a helping hand. 
There is nothing like breaking bread with people to gain their trust and begin the foundation for a healthy relationship. We hope that this story inspires you to consider our request for increased funding through our DHHS contract, the details of which we laid out at yesterday's testimony. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Phoebe Hernandez. We're giving a testimony in Spanish. Phoebe, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Buenas noches, miembros del Consejo, Presidente Gael Albuñoz y Vicepresidente Evan Glass. Es para mí un honor testificar ante ustedes. Mi nombre es Fe Hernández, soy residente del área de Tacoma Park desde hace muchos años. Quisiera solicitar ante ustedes que se considere invertir más fondos en vigilancia policial, sobre todo en el área de los apartamentos de la Gringo, ubicados en esta misma calle. La razón que solicito esto es porque detrás de estos apartamentos se juntan jóvenes a hacer drogas. Y esto es un riesgo para nosotros los que vivimos en estos apartamentos. También estos jóvenes están en edad escolar y son un mal ejemplo para nuestros niños. Esto sucede en estos momentos. Imagínense cómo va a ser cuando termine el año escolar que los jóvenes están desocupados. También quisiera se considere invertir en programas de recreación. Quizás estos jóvenes dejen estas actividades negativas invirtiendo su tiempo en deportes y actividades de mayor beneficio para ellos. Gracias por su tiempo. Buenas noches. Uh, good evening, members of the Council, President Gail Albornoz and Vice President Evan Glass. I am honored to testify before you. My name is Febe Hernandez, and I have been a resident of Tacoma Park for many years. I would like to ask you to consider spending more funds on patrolling the area of the Green Good Apartments located just down the streets. I am requesting this because behind these apartments, you see always uh, young people that get to Together to do drugs, uh, which poses a risk for those of us who live in those apartment complex. And since uh, these are young people of school age, they are setting a bad example for our children. This is happening right now. And I ask you to imagine how much worse the situation will be when the school year ends and when these young people have nothing else to do. I would also like you to to consider investing in recreational programs. So perhaps this uh, young people will stop the negative activities and instead they would invest their time in sports and activities of greater benefit to all of them. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Doris Wynn. Doris, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council. My name is Doris Nguyen and I am speaking today on behalf of the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan Coalition and also wanted to let you know we endorse Sylvia Tognetti's testimony later tonight on adaptation and sequestration. We support the county executive's fiscal year 23 budget and applaud the focus on funding equitable and vital climate priorities to address the current climate emergency. I would like to remind the council that every Montgomery County resident will eventually be impacted by climate change and some have already been impacted. The youth of today for which we fight to provide the best education will have climate change overwhelm their future, no matter their education. The many needs we have been hearing about tonight from the many speakers will be amplified with climate change. So this budget is a step forward, although not sufficient to the cap goals. There are specific areas where we believe the County Council can strengthen this otherwise laudable budget, specifically related to number one, Accelerate investment to expand generation and use of renewable energy. The three FTEs in the non-departmental -department, account are essential for focusing on EV adoption, an electric charging strategy, clean energy development, implementing community choice energy, and other items. Given the appropriate breadth of this ambition, we recommend this be raised to five FTEs, not just three, to make real headway. Add, and the second, we want to add funding for evaluating the budget against the county's greenhouse gas reduction goals. There's no way to tell whether our investments track a critical path to meeting the cap goals. Related to this, the budget for the Office of Legislative Oversight is flat and does not consider the added work we expect when you pass the climate assessment bill. Therefore, we strongly recommend adding an FTE to support OLO and DEP for, for performance measurement. 
And number three, increase funding levels for incentives for res residential retrofits, as well as set-asides for low- and moderate-income households. And lastly, in the study on flooding, we would like to see funds added to include home flooding due to overland runoff. Montgomery County has an opportunity to be a national leader in fighting climate change and meeting climate goals. We urge passage of an equally ambitious budget to meet our climate challenges. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Marlene Beckman. Marlene, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Uh, my, my name is Marlene Beckman and I'm here before the council to ask them to reverse the DHHS decision to close the Oak Chapel Hub. As a volunteer for the past 10 months, I'm testifying today based on firsthand eyewitness evidence, evidence that I observed again this morning that the need for this hub remains a vibrant as a lifeline for the many local residents who rely on it for regular food distribution. I live in Cabin John, and along with my husband, I travel 22 miles each way and use the toll road weekly to distribute canned goods, produce, and eggs. The first time that I saw the line of hundreds of cars lined up for blocks, hours before the hub opened, I cried, not in my county. While the need may have started with COVID, it is not abated as I have witnessed for months and again this morning. And while there are hundreds of cars that line up each week, there are also the walk-ups. That is mothers holding the hands of one, two, three small children lining up with their shopping carts and using their shopping carts or their baby strollers to carry home as much of, of what they can that is being given out. And then there is the diversity of the community that is served by Oak Chapel, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, black, and white. I'm a lifelong resident of Montgomery County, and I've been an active volunteer, as some of you on the council know, serving on the Criminal Justice Coordinating Commission, as well as being a CASA. And I've never written a letter, and I've never testified before the county council. This is the first time. This is because I see with my own eyes, the gratitude of this community. And I hear the many God bless you's as I load their cars with groceries. Please vote to reverse the DHHS decision and keep this vital community resource open. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Mario Rivas. Mario, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Buenas noches, miembros del Consejo del Condado Montgomery. Quiero agradecer la oportunidad que se me ha brindado de testificar ante ustedes. Mi nombre es Mario Rivas, soy residente de este condado desde hace muchos años. Estoy ante ustedes para pedirles que se destinen más fondos en seguridad pública. Los residentes del área de Witton necesitamos más vigilancia policial en las noches, sobre todo en las áreas de la estación del metro y la avenida Georgia, sobre todo después de las 11 p.m., donde se han realizado actos de vandalismo, robos y actos criminales. En estas horas de la noche es cuando regresan algunas personas que trabajan en restaurantes, trabajan haciendo limpieza en edificios y en otros trabajos. Algunos ya han sido atacados por delincuentes que deambulan por esas áreas. Ante esta situación solicito a ustedes que se incremente la vigilancia policial en el área. 
sobre todo en estas horas que son de riesgo para nosotros los que usamos el transporte público para evitar cualquier acto criminal que atente contra nuestras vidas. Espero que consideren mi propuesta. Gracias por el tiempo. Buenas noches. Good evening, members of the County Council. I want to thank you for the opportunity you give me to testify before you. My name is Mario Rivas, and I have been a resident of this county for many years. I am testifying before you to ask you to allocate more funds for public safety. Residents of the Wheaton area need more police presence, especially at night near the metro station in Georgia, located at the Georgia Avenue. Uh, in on hours after 11 p.m., which are the areas where most uh, crimes occur, also acts of vandalism, robberies, and criminal activities. These late hours of the night are usually the times when many people who work in restaurants or, cl or cleaning houses return home, and some have already been attacked by criminals who roam the area. Given this, this situation, I ask you to increase police presence in the area, especially during those hours where in at late at night, uh, where it's more risky for all of us, and especially to those who use the public transportation. This would definitely protect our lives. I hope that you will consider my request. Thank you for your time and good evening to all of you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have David McGill. David, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. First, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Good. Well, first of all, um, uh, President Alvernaz and the council, um, thank you for the time you're taking to listen to so many people on so many issues. Um, sitting here as a resident and listening to the issues you have to deal with uh, from small businesses affected by the purple line to safety issues, the environment, it's, it's really very impressive and there's so much you have, you have to do and so much impact you can make. Um, you can imagine I'm here to talk about, uh, on behalf of more about trails and, 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 uh, parks budget. Um, so here's an opportunity to talk perhaps for many people for whom the parks provide joy, a serenity, um, and health, and community. And those are really, really valuable things, as you know. Um, you have supported tremendously the investment in parks budget and trails budget. Um, the operating side is, is very important so that people really can appreciate and get involved in what is out there for so many residents. And <clears throat> this is something that cuts across from the lowest income to the highest income, um, your, your parks department, which you have created as one of the finest in the country. So just a couple of basic points. The volunteer program is excellent. I mean, I get to see as, as uh, involved in more various counties and what you're doing here with your volunteer program is excellent. It really is and it involves so many people and they feel so involved and gratified. The other area that I want to mention that is a new initiative for the parks is uh, getting more low-income people out on trails and out on bikes on different ways, whether it's walking or biking um, or whatever. And there's a program to buy bikes and get people out on trails so I know you have many needs to meet, but thank you for focusing on the many residents who just want to appreciate why it is great to live in Montgomery County and the, and the Parks Department is a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Sylvia Tangetni. Sylvia Tognetti. Sylvia, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, and thank you to the council and President Albernos. Um, um, my testimony supports the uh, Climate Action Plan Coalition and reflects the perspective more specifically of its work group on adaptation and sequestration that I'm a part of. 
We strongly support the uh, significant new funding for nature-based solutions because in addition to sequestering carbon, they bring multiple benefits that provide a foundation for climate resilience and intersect very much with equity concerns. The flood management program in particular includes badly needed resources to map high-risk areas and would ideally be expanded to identify patterns of basement flooding. When I and a few others inquired about flooding data a few years ago, as we heard so many anecdotal accounts of basement flooding where it had never occurred before and mold, we found that county information on this was also anecdotal. And it still is because um, COVID made it impossible to add this critical funding to the budget. Um, natural, the Natural Climate Solutions Program would complement both the flood management and the existing stormwater management programs with additional mapping to identify priority areas and therefore maximize the many co-benefits of tree canopy and forests that I don't have time to discuss. We were pleased to see the modest additional funding for the Rainscapes Program and the DEP budget as it is among the few tools we have for managing stormwater on private property, and it has been understaffed and oversubscribed. I'm going to have to refer you to my written testimony for a suggested dedicated source of funding for Rainscapes. Uh, other important details and uh, explanation of why our natural infrastructure is even more critical than our critical infrastructure and merits even higher priority. Uh, given the climate emergency, it is simply not possible to provide sufficient funding for all that needs to be done. But even as is, this budget for climate adaptation is a giant leap forward, which I and the coalition strongly support. And I draw your attention to the picture behind me, which is floodwaters pouring into our backup drought reservoir, drinking water reservoir, during the July 2019 rain bomb. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Dan Thompson. Dan, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the Wheaton Urban District Advisory Committee's request that $30,000 be added to the Urban District's budget to help put on the Wheaton Arts Parade and Festival. In just six years, Wheaton has created an annual tradition. The parade is more than art. It attracts crowds to Wheaton. It markets Wheaton as a destination. It activates the urban district. Now, the urban district's request acknowledges that the county incurs expenses producing this event, police overtime, clean and safe team, DOT traffic controls, and a lot of planning and coordination by the town manager and other county employees. Our grant from the Arts Council is only $8,000 this year, and the tents alone cost $18,000. I've given six years of my retirement to get this event off the ground. Now the parade and festival have the potential to go on for many years, but not unless Wheaton lays the foundation for sustainability. Funds are needed to manage the event after my pro bono service ends. And this raises a question. Can the Wheaton Arts and Entertainment District take over the management of the parade and festival? Personally, I don't think the A&E District can manage anything without staff and without a board of advisors made up of artists and arts organizations. There's no point of contact designated on Wheaton websites for the A&E district. Just recently, I learned that WUDAC is supposed to serve as the A&E advisory board, but nobody on WUDAC even knows that. And WUDAC's statute doesn't require representation by artists or arts organizations. The A&E district has a much more narrow focus than WUDAC. And an A&E board probably needs to meet more than two hours each month. But don't take my word for it. Have public meetings to discuss how to manage the A&E district. Most of all, it needs an FTE for a director to work under Luisa Cardona. Current urban district staff can't take on the A&E district when they already have a full plate. And you can't manage it from Silver Spring. It needs to be run by the Wheaton community. I hope the county will get serious about the A&E district and create an FTE for the director of the, in the urban district so that the county can sustain the Wheaton Arts Parade and Festival. And for now, though, I urge you to provide the urban district with the 30K WUDAC requested in FY23 to support the Parade and Festival. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Council Member Navarro, for your service. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Up next, we have Maury Peterson. Maury, you have two minutes to give your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. I think you're muted. Uh, 
I'm off. There we go. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. So last but not least, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Maury Peterson, the Executive Director at Rebuilding Together Montgomery County. And as you all know, our mission is to provide critical home repairs and accessibility modifications for the most vulnerable homeowners, uh, including seniors, veterans, people with disabilities, struggling families with children, and marginalized community members. Um, this year, we're celebrating our 32nd anniversary. Um, to date, we've served over 2,600 low-income families and galvanized more than 50,000 community volunteers. I know many of you have have volunteered with us in the past and, and taken part in our neighbor helping neighbor approach. Um, I'm here tonight just to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the council for Montgomery County's long-term financial support of rebuilding together in Montgomery County. You really do make our work possible. Um, as you know, our, our organization is committed fully to pr the preservation of existing affordable housing. We don't construct new homes, but instead help the average, rarely recognized, low-income homeowner who's in desperate need of critical repairs to allow them to remain safe and healthy in their own homes. Um, for example, we recently served an 89-year-old veteran who had water pouring into his home from a leaking roof and foundation issues. We were able to put a new roof on his house um, and also shore up the, the waterproofing, you know, thanks to grant money that we received from the county. Um, so in addition to that, we also help other nonprofits with critical home repairs. We, we have recently worked with Interfaith Works, Stepping Stone Shelter, and Housing Unlimited. Um, but the pandemic has hit our organization hard. Um, the need for our services has never been greater. And so um, the cost of materials, as you all know, building materials have gone through the roof and, and raised up dramatically. Uh, we were also having to pay contractors um, more money um, than, than in the past. Um, but grateful for the support, we, we were able to serve a record 178 uh, families last fiscal year, and we're on pace to do another 150 by June 30th this year. So um, to address the backlog of the vulnerable homeowners that are waiting for services, um, I have two requests for, for all of you. One is to keep the county executive's proposed 6% increase to the nonprofit county contracts in the budget. We'd heard that there was some talk of, of cutting that back. Um, and then secondly, um, I would love to have you allocate and release um, ARPA money, the American Rescue Plan Act funds for affordable housing. Specifically, um, Rebuilding Together is part of the Montgomery Housing Alliance, Alliance, and we have put together a proposal of about $20 million um, to present, and we have presented that to the county executive, as well as many of you have seen it. Um, and we would really love to get that money so that we could help more low-income homeowners remain in the county safely in their homes. And then I just want to add... Um, add Marie, I'm so sorry that your two minutes is um, well overdue. Sorry about that. So okay, sorry, sorry about it. Thank you. That's okay. You can definitely provide a written testimony as well. And we thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council President, that actually wraps up the speakers for the public hearing this evening. I'm going to go ahead and toss it back to you to close this out. Well, thank you all again for your incredibly thoughtful and impassioned and powerful testimony. Uh, you've given us much more to think about as we deliberate through this budget process. Uh, we appreciate all of your civic activism and we appreciate the thoughtful approach that you have provided this evening's testimony. Thank you, Jordan, for facilitating tonight's discussion. And with that, this public hearing is now closed and we are adjourned. Good night, everyone.